Hi, I'm firearms attorney Gilbert Ambler, and we're back today to talk about the ATF's new anti-industry, anti-collector initiative, what they're going to call their engaged in the business rule. Now, we've done a previous video on this subject, which we will link to in the comments back before it was published in the final register. However, there's now been a lot of YouTube commenters talking about this, and there's a couple of things that have not been widely discussed that I think are critical to almost every gun owner and certainly every gun collector out there. We're going to discuss them today. But before we dive into those subjects, if you have not yet hit that subscribe button, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button, like, comment with your thoughts, and share with your friends. That way, you and your friends can keep getting this important Second Amendment-related content. The first thing that we want to talk about with the engaged in the business rule is the fact that many people seem to be glossing over, which is that you cannot avoid this rule simply by selling firearms through an FFL. Most of the firearm owners that I've spoken with over the past couple of weeks have seemed to have this assumption that they can avoid falling under the purview of this rule simply by transferring firearms through an FFL. In their minds, what the ATF really wants is a background check done before a gun is sold and records of who the firearm is being sold to. And so they assume up here that if they're selling through another FFL, then that background check is getting done, the records are being kept on who the firearm is being transferred to, and everything will be right in the world. ATF won't come after them. Unfortunately, that's not true. There are no exceptions in this final rule for simply selling firearms for the motive of a profit through another FFL. If you are selling and your motive is profit, and you fall within any of those presumptions that the ATF talks about, you keep records, you sell more than one handgun, more than one firearm, excuse me, not handgun, more than one firearm in like new condition and original wrapping, etc. Even if you are selling through another FFL, even if you're paying transfer fees, you would still run afoul of the ATF's final rule and they would presume you absent reliable evidence to the contrary to be engaged in the business and to require your own FFL. And when I say FFL, of course, I'm talking about a federal firearms license. Now, why is the ATF taking this position? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, this is just going to dissuade gun collecting. I mean, after all, one of the things that most collectors want is to make money on things. They want things to be valuable. They want to do well. Now, they're not doing it typically for things, and, you know, in the past, the definition of uh, who needed an FFL was if you were engaged in the business, if you were operating with the primary objective of profit and livelihood, that doesn't fit most collectors. But wanting to make a little money on your investments? Sure, that probably fits an awful lot of gun owners, which is why this language change in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is so dangerous. I mean, ask a stamp collector. Stamp collectors like to find valuable stamps. They probably hope that the value goes up. Same for gun owners. But if they're buying and holding on to guns in like new condition and then selling them for more than they paid for it, ATF is going to presume that their principal objective is profit. And of course, they probably want to make a profit. That's not necessarily their principal objective because if it was just about making money, there's far more things that they could do with that money, like put it in stocks, bonds, real estate, that would probably make them more money. They're probably acting as a collector that being said, ATF might come after them. All right. The other thing that we need to think about on why the ATF would be taking this stance that even if you're selling through an FFL, you might still be subject to the rule if you hit their presumptions is because it would be logically incoherent for them. And it would really undermine their credibility if they said there's an exemption if you're selling through an FFL because the law doesn't have that exemption. So if ATF created that exemption out of thin air and said, we think if you're selling multiple guns in like new condition, you are uh, engaged in the business and you need to have your own FFL unless you sell through another FFL, then they would be attacked on that basis by all the groups that are going to be filing suit saying, see ATF, you're just making this stuff up and this is really just about getting those records. And as long as there are records because it goes through a FFL, it doesn't matter if the seller has an FFL. So I think the ATF understands that. That's why there is no exception should you be selling through an FFL? Now, practically speaking, is it as likely that they're going to target you if all of your sales are through an FFL? Probably not. Legally, 
based on their rule, could they? Absolutely they could, which is why my advice right now, until this is all sorted out, is that nobody should be selling any firearms. And I actually think that's good, generally speaking, hang on to your guns, but especially with this rule, you don't wanna be selling firearms. The second thing that I think people are missing is that the ATF kind of glosses over this idea of go get an FFL and then you'll be covered. Once you have an FFL, you'll be covered. In our prior video on this subject, again, we're going to link to that in the comments below. In our private video, we talked about some of the complications, some of the inspection complications, especially if you're a home-based FFL, that the ATF can come in and do an administrative inspection and go through your home, if that is your licensed premise, on the basis of no more than once a year once you become an FFL. There's also other reporting and record-keeping requirements to know about. But one of the things that I think hasn't been talked about yet much is the fact that many people are not going to be eligible for an FFL. Why is this? Well, we, we could talk and we could do whole videos on the subject of applying for an FFL. And if you're interested in those, let me know, put it in the comments below and we could do that. But one of the things that you have to certify when applying for the FFL is that you are going to be compliant with all state and local laws. And that includes zoning restrictions. Many people live in neighborhoods where the zoning does not allow them to run a business enterprise, meaning that if they apply for an FFL based out of their home, because really they're just a collector and they're afraid of the ATF's new rule, and so they're worried that the ATF might target them, so they want an FFL. When they apply for that FFL, they would probably be told no based on the zoning requirements, because if they're not zoned for a business, that's something that the ATF is going to discover during the initial inspection. And if they don't have the proper zoning, they're not going to get approved for the FFL. So although the ATF makes it sound like, just go get an FFL, everything's going to be okay. A lot of people that probably would want them to provide themselves cover from the ATF won't be eligible to get one because of their zoning requirements where they live, which would force them to either go get a brick and mortar, a separate location to conduct business from, or to stop selling any firearms, period, for fear of running afoul of the ATF's new rule. If you enjoyed this content, hit that subscribe button, give it a like, let us know your thoughts. Until next time.